Welcome and good evening, everyone. It's with great pleasure that I'm announcing tonight's guest artist explorer, speaker, John Muir Laws. He's an award-winning author, naturalist, illustrator, teacher. All these descriptions fit our speaker tonight, and yet the sum is really greater than all the parts here. So he is also the founder of the Nature Journal Club that combines field trips and field sketching. If you're an educator, you may already be familiar with the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling, which is influencing the development of curricula in classrooms. So if you're interested in learning more about John Muir Laws, I also highly recommend going to his website and his YouTube channel, where he's got an abundance of incredible videos about um, painting and sketching techniques. And to tie it back to Tony Foster, our guest, um, who I, reminds me of, um, of Tony in many ways. Tony is fond of saying that he has as many friends who are scientists or as who are artists. Um, I'd say both fields really benefit from really keen observation skills, attention to detail, curiosity about life, and also practicing what they do on a daily basis. Um, in this sense, I think Tony and John Muir Laws inspire the rest of us to do the same. They're both amazing in those areas. So this evening, John Muir Laws will be speaking about his six years he spent illustrating the Laws Field Guide to the Sierra Nevada, and with luck, we'll get to hear more about his current and future work. Um, so it's with great appreciation um, that we welcome tonight's speaker. Please give John Muir Laws a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm really, really delighted and honored to be here. Uh, Tony Foster, to me, is an incredibly inspirational man. I don't think anybody embodies the idea of a sense of place more than he does. You can look at his, his, his work, and I just sort of imagine him falling in love with this place, with this place, with this place. I think that love is the act of attention the act of attention. Think of that in terms of your relationship with your partner, or a child, or a place that you know. It's through that deep attention that we do build a bond. We build a relationship. Um, and I found that in my work, uh, a very similar thing has happened. Um, and I'll kind of take you on my path of, of what got me started uh, doing the sorts of of, of nature journaling and artwork that I did and how that kind of was a bridge to conservation, very much like, uh, like Tony. Um, I got a start on this, there we go, um, at a very early age. Um, so that's me, that's mom, that's my dad right up there, there's me again, nice boots. And my dad was the family bird watcher and my mom was the family botanist, so I kind of grew up doing Right? And so every sort of family trip was, a, was, a, was a, a, some sort of a natural history adventure. And the, it, that, that bug took hold and I never stopped. When I was in high school, I was hiking the John Muir Trail. And um, I had, maybe some of you have had this problem, too many field guides. Um, I was just, I was a nature nerd and too many books. I still have that problem today. And <laughs> the, uh, so you're, you're, you're out there and you're thinking like, well, maybe this time I'll make it easier for myself and I'll just bring the flower guides to make your backpack a little bit lighter. And if you do that, that's guaranteed when, when, when something else will show up that's not in your, <laughs> In, in your flower guide. So um, my, my idea was I wanted to have one book that would be birds, reptiles, mammals, star charts, everything. And all with color pictures because I'm dyslexic and I like color pictures. Um, so uh, my grandmother was my artistic muse and um, on her deathbed, she gave me time to think about what I wanted my life to be about when I was in that place. And I realized that I would be lying there thinking, you know, I really should have made that book. <laughs> and so her last gift to me was the inspiration to quit my job, to fill my backpack up with paper and granola bars, and to take off to the Sierra Nevada. 
And for the next seven years, sorry, six years, this was my office. I finally got the, uh, the office with the view. <laughs> um, and I would start at low elevation as sort of spring was springing and then progressively make my way up higher elevation as the snows would melt and I'd make my way further north, sort of following the blooms of different flowers. Um, this is one of my favorite spots. I just got a chance to revisit it with some friends. This is Glass Creek Meadow on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. And it's just a sea of buttercups. And this was one of my early, early drawings. And something that's really fun about this, so um, for the, the botanists out here, the buttercup, the Latin name for the buttercup is ranunculus. Right? So what, you, I know we don't care, but, um, but that translates to little frogs because they always are in wet, boggy places. And what's really cool about this meadow is that it's also filled with little frogs. Um, actually, these are toads. These are the Yosemite toads. And the, um, at the right time of the year, the, the entire meadow is trilling with their, their little calls. So here's, here's the, the, the little toads among the little frogs. And um, so this was, I, I had chances just to kind of, I would, I would hike around with a few field guides. I would find some flower that I hadn't painted yet. And I would plop myself down next to it, kind of make myself comfortable. Because I, I knew that once I started, I would get into a flow state and I would not come out of this state for maybe a couple of hours. And you know, just, your leg would be completely numb. And, but but the, the whole world would whoosh, come into the focus around this one flower that I was painting. And I uh, did everything on a very sort of portable eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. So I was kind of the, the, the opposite of, of, of Tony's approach here, where the canvas is big and the palette is small. I'll show you my palette later. I had a bigger palette, but smaller paper. Um, and something that I, I did discover, though, that was amazing about this approach is that when you go out there, when you go tromping out into nature, um, does anybody remember Bambi, right? right? You know, and man has come to the forest, and all the animals are hiding. So that really happens. So the minute you appear in the valley, there's this shock wave that goes through the valley. And whew, there's this bubble of silence around you. But the longer you can get yourself to sit still and quietly, the more this bubble starts to shrink. And the animals start to come out at the periphery of it. And the more you're still and quiet, the more come out, the more come out, the more come out, until they're popping out right around you. So um, here you are in the mountains, you're focusing on your flower. You see that little bump right there? All right, I was, I was painting my flower next to these rocks, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move. And I looked up, and it was just this field of granite boulders. I thought, oh, that's weird, must be dehydrated, and drank a little bit of water. So then went back into it and kind of got into the zone and got into the zone. I was just like, oh, I'm drawing my flower, drawing my flower. I'm one with the flower. And then, and then all of a sudden, bloop, this thing, I see movement again, and I look up, and there's nothing there. And it's really weird, because I was, you know, I'm, I'm sure, that I, just, I, I know I saw something, but I'm staring at this pile of rocks where the movement was, and there is nothing. And then all of a sudden, one of the rocks right in front of me gets up, stands up, shakes out its feathers, and starts walking around. So if you, if you look at this thing, you look at the rocks, first of all, sort of red-brown patches, black and white flecks. The bird, red-brown patches, black and white flecks. And in winter, this is how it looks, same bird, right? So this thing is so convinced of its camouflage and knows that it works. I was as close to this bird as I am to you, and it had moved, and I looked up, and I could not see it. And, but once it started moves, like all of a sudden, the form of this bird appears in front of me. So there were, there were these multiple experiences like that, where I would go out, and I would start with the flower, and then this little critter would pop up. And so you have to kind of go, OK, flower's done for now. Flower's going to wait. And you jump over to the ptarmigan. 
right? You start working the tarmogen, working the tarmogen, working the tarmogen, until the tarmogen waddles off, and then you can start going to your flower again. So it was, I went to some of, I went to all the flowers, but many of the animals came to me. And um, I, would, I would work all the way through summertime and into the fall and into the rainy season because there would be kind of different periods where different plants would be blooming. But then I discovered that it is very hard to draw Sierra wildflowers in the snow. <laughs> so uh, this is my snow cave. Um, they are really warm. But it's very difficult to draw wildflowers um, during this, this, this season. So when this season would hit, I would drop out of the mountains, come back down, get a shower, and go to the California Academy of Sciences. And the, the Academy of Sciences, underneath it, is this sort of, it's kind of like the X-Files. These giant hallways filled with, you know, pickled frogs and kind of bobbing around in, and, and these you know, trays and trays and trays of, of bugs with pins through them. And so I would look through these preserved specimens to get the up-close looks at the animals that I had been looking at in the field. And then my studio changed dramatically. The Academy of Sciences th decided, wouldn't it be fun, if you're going to be drawing these pictures, how would you like to work out on the museum floor? And so I was their kind of living illustrator exhibit. And the, uh, so people would come up and you'd talk to them about the critters and you'd, you'd get a few brush strokes in. And I discovered that it, it is, uh, I, I got a little bit better at it, but it would be very difficult to do two things at the same time. So that kind of prolonged my project, but it was really fun because I love interacting with Homo sapiens. They're my species. Um, but it was, it was just an, an, an absolute blast. And you'd, you'd kind of, there would be also kids that would then go away and come back the next day with their own journals and their own stuff to draw with. And I would set up a place at the table, and we'd all sit there and we'd draw dragonflies together. It was a lot of fun. Um, and over this time, I did one after another, after another, after another, after another, approximately 3,000 watercolor paintings. And the trick is, when you finish one, to start the next. Um, and see, I, it's, it's impossible for me to do a six-year project and draw 3,000 watercolor paintings. But I can do the next one. And I can do the next one. And so something that was really satisfying about this is that with some projects, you don't really kind of see where you're going until the very end of the project. With this project, at, you know, every little hour and a half, which is about the time it took to do one bug, right? every little hour and a half, you kind of come up and you kind of get this little dopamine rush of like, oh, completion of a project. And then you kind of go back into the next one. And that kept me going, 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 going. It's interesting, when I was a kid in school, I would have been diagnosed as ADHD, right? the kid who cannot pay attention. But this project had me completely engrossed. And I would, by my attention, I would fall in love with the bee fly, with, with every little critter as I came across it. And there were so many sort of weird and wonderful shapes. So my criteria for getting in the book was you either had to be so common that everybody's going to be seeing you, so spectacularly beautiful that when somebody does come across you, even if it's rare, they'd go, oh, what is this thing? <laughs> right? Or things that just had such an interesting backstory to them that, um, that I, I, I couldn't help it. And so that was, um, that kind of, I learned a ton, a ton doing this. But it was birds and wildflowers, and most of the, the plants were done from life in the field. Um, for the birds, I would make quick sketches in the field and then really juice those up in post-production um, with uh, stuffed specimens. The insects were mostly drawn in those museum settings. Um, because in, in order to I would put those under a, a microscope and kind of make the bug big, um, it's a lot easier to draw them that way. And then when you draw it this big and then you reduce it down to this big, everybody thinks you've got really, really good hand-eye coordination. 
<clears throat> and it's like, I can't believe you drew all those little bugs. And, oh, they were big. Um, and um, for the mammals, it was a combination. You have to have experience drawing them in the field to make them look alive when you draw them. But then having study skins and pelts and those sort of things to get the hair by hair detail, um, that, that, that made a big difference. Um, but that was, it, was a, it was a lot of paintings. Um, and I'd often try to do them from a pose that would be useful, something that people would really see. Thus the, <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, and also, you know, it took so long, I, I eventually, this is my receding hairline. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, the, uh, the birds, I kind of did very often in the kind of uh, field guide position where it's a, it's, a, it's a side view. And the flowers, what I'd do is I would look around at a bunch of different wildflowers and try to kind of get a general sense of what this species looks like across a number of species. Then I would find one individual that was kind of representative. It kind of looked like, you know, it was sort of an average wildflower. And then I would try to draw that individual with all of its little nuances and kind of tilted leaves and bug bites and spots on it. And that gave the drawings a lot more of a sense of life. Um, the, uh, I also learned a lot of cool things about the Sierra Nevada. For instance, did you know that if you want to make a field guide to the Sierra Nevada, you need to draw lots of chipmunks. As a matter of fact, the Sierra Nevada is the worldwide hub of chipmunk diversity. There is no place that you can go and find more species of chipmunks. But when you really kind of get into it, they actually are different. Um, some of them have great field marks. This is, this is the one with big ears. All right, some of them are rusty, how bold the stripes are, um, whether they're kind of gray stripes or bright white stripes. All those things make a big difference in the chipmunk department. And they also have tails where the underside of the tail is a, also a kind of a key color. So the chipmunks, I kind of had them do a little bit of yoga <laughs> to, so you could see all the, 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 the poses that you would want. And then I would take these pictures so I'm a generalist. I'm a generalist wildlife biologist. Um, and I decided I needed to get feedback from the experts. So I would bring my drawings around to, um, this is working with Bob Patterson, uh, who's one of our state's really top-notch botanists. And he and his graduate students, we would sit down and I would put the drawing in front of them and they would look at it and they'd go like, hmm, hmm. And sometimes they go like, ah, oh, yeah, and it go, Phew. but there are a lot of hmms where, where they would say like, you know, this, this, you know, this doesn't really have the, the, the feeling of this species, and I would have to kind of go back to the field and try to get that same flower on another day and another time. Um, but because I got that feedback ahead of time, the ones that finally made it into the book um, were much more useful drawings. Um, this is drawing poo. Um, the, uh, there's a scat section in the book. To get tracks and scat, I went to Montana to the lab of James Halfpenny. And this guy has his scat together. He has these, <laughs> these he's got these enormous trays all with little labels of where and when for all these different species. I could go to one place and kind of get like, here's the bear in the fall, here's the bear. And like, so you know, here is the bear with, with, with grass, the bear with meat, the bear if it ate too many uh, manzanita berries. And um, so it was really fun. I got to go all around the, the Sierra Nevada and all around the country meeting these people who were the hot shots in their field. And they were incredibly generous. They all donated their time and just thought it was really fun. I met the leech guy. Right? There's a leech expert in California. And when he found out that somebody really wanted to know about his leeches, <laughs> he was just like, <laughs> and you're going to make color pictures of them too? <laughs> That's beautiful. It was wonderful and just, you know, just got to meet such wonderful, wonderful people. 
And then I would take those guides and uh, those, those drawings and print out, I developed my own kind of system for printing out draft versions of the book. And I put those into the hands of people who might be users and was able to figure out what worked and didn't work um, before the book came out. And so that you could, you know, make, uh, you know, discovering that like with, you know, it really helps to have butterfly drawings be life size, right? Um, the, uh, so for all sorts of different taxa, I learned lots of tricks and lots of techniques for getting those down on paper. A few other tricks that we've, I figured out. Most people who make field guides, they think taxonomically. If you're gonna make a field guide to birds, you probably spent your life studying birds. So it makes perfect sense to you, like how do I organize this book about birds? Hmm, what about the simplest way? The order of bird evolution. <laughs> yeah, um, did you know that's how most bird books are organized? Yeah, the, why are the loons at the front and the warblers at the back, all right? This is, they're going in what's called taxonomic phylogenetic order. They're more sort of primitive ones are at the start and the more derived ones are towards the back of the book. But most of us don't walk up to a bird and kind of like, wow, that looks really primitive. <laughs> all right? Now, and if you do, you don't need the book. <laughs> so with my birds, I, I kind of look at a bird and kind of like, it's little, it's blue. I'm gonna put the little blue birds together. Right? So the little bluebirds go together. Um, and that, you know, you can flip to the little bluebird section and you've got a fighting chance of, of being able to identify who you're seeing. So that was my process. That was the birth of the Law's Guide to the Sierra Nevada. And doing this, I refined my drawing and sketching technique dramatically. There are a lot of changes that went on both in terms of equipment and technique. And I want to share a few of those ideas with you. How many artists are in the room? All right. Yeah, you can raise your hand. All right. um, so I, we'll return to that at the end because I want to make it actually more of you. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. This is my kit. All right, so bigger palette, smaller paper, All right? Um, this is my, the watercolor kit that there, I saw, did you see Tony's out there? Yeah. Like, it's this big. <laughs> yeah, he's my hero. Um, so uh, I have a, um, I, I actually like having more colors, um, but it does make the kit a little bit bigger and cumbersome. But to make my tools a little bit easier, I wanted to show you a couple of the really tricky things. So, <clears throat> Tony's got a lot of brushes. I've got one, <laughs> right? Um, this is my favorite brush. It has the water inside the handle. Ooh, <laughs> right? So what you do is you take, you go like that, and the water can get to the tip. If there's too much water, you can kind of give it a wipe there. You put it in here. There's now water on your brush with paint. You paint on your paper. When you're done, you give it a squeeze and a wipe on the old sock on your wrist. <laughs> your brush is clean. And you're on to the next color. So um, all those paintings that you saw in that book, they were all done with one of these brushes. They're cheap. They cost about nine bucks. And for me, they are just the most logistically easy thing to use out there. They're also the eco-friendly way to do watercolor in the field. Um, if you're using quality paints, you may have cadmiums and cobalts and things like that in your paints and chromiums and all this sort of stuff. If you are kind of getting a jar of ding, 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 mucky water, and you're somewhere in the high Sierra, what do we do with that water before we head on out? Yeah. Oh, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Well, what most people do is they just dump it out there. But if you look at the marmots, the marmots are out there going. <laughs> here, it all goes on here, right? And so you don't have any little puddles of toxic waste behind you in the field. So that's really nice. Um, 
The other tool that I find, and I'll be kind of demonstrating this for you in just a moment, um, the other thing that I, for me is an absolute game, game changer is, f for me, it is impossible to do two things at the same time, all right? If you've looked at Tony Foster's process, he first carefully lays things out, then he gets in there and paints. So he's not walking up to the canvas and kind of going like, oh, I think there might be rocks here. Right, he lays it out first. See, when you're thinking about what paint to apply, your brain can't handle where does it go. Right? So um, you cannot do two things at the same time. And the more that you try to do that, the harder it is for you to draw and paint. So that's why I use this pencil. This is an erasable non-photo blue pencil. It's an extremely pale light blue pencil. And I use this for my layout. And I draw in the basic shape and the proportions of whatever it is that I'm looking at. And then I can go on top of that with a regular graphite pencil or a pen and draw in more details. Right. But that goes on top of a framework which has already, it's already got the basic shape. And then I can get my water brush and paint on top of that. So that makes it a lot easier to, to draw. So you do not have to do everything at once. So let me show you kind of how this would look and kind of my, my flow, my process. By the way, this isn't the only way to do it. This isn't the right way to do it. This is the way that I do it and it works for me, but you can adopt it if you want to. All right, this is a demonstration of how I might go about drawing a dragonfly. And I'm going to start showing you the kinds of loose shapes I would make with that non-photo blue pencil. All right, so my basic I would start with something like this, that the dragonfly, here's the axis of its body. It's got a little chunk here of its body, and there's its head. And here what I'm looking at is when it's, per, when it's grabbing onto that little blade of grass, what is the angle of its body? How big is its head compared to its thorax? And where are its wings? So notice that there's no detail in this part of the drawing. I'm just loosely blocking in where different parts go. And these could be with really, really sketchy lines. This is much bolder than the lines you will get with a non-photo blue pencil. With a non-photo blue pencil, when you draw with it, it'll be just bold enough for you to be able to see it when you have the paper this far from your face. So when you start to draw on top of that with a graphite pencil, your brain completely ignores that all those blue lines are there. So my approach is I start with a non-photo blue pencil, I then jump over to a graphite pencil, and then I, um, I don't even have to get in there and erase those non-photo blue pencil lines. People will essentially ignore that they're there. Um, once I've got this, I've made myself a coloring book. And I can start to color it in. My approach is to begin with the shadows. If you put shadows in at the end of a drawing, it will feel like an afterthought because it is. Instead, I put them in at the start when I can just sort of, I've got no distraction of color, just which way is the light coming from, what's in shadow, what's in light. I get that blocked in, and I use sort of a purple-gray mixture, sort of a purple-gray color. Purple-gray will blend and mix with lots of other different colors successfully, including yellows. Um, so you can use it as sort of a background ghost shadow color for any color you're working on. So I block in my purple-gray shadow, and then I let that dry. I can glaze lightly over the top of that the next color, coat of color. If I want something to look transparent, I use the same color, just a little bit lighter. So that I get by squeezing a little bit more water into the brush, getting rid of a little bit of the paint. Same color painted on there, just without as much paint. More water, less paint. So you see, at this point, it still looks sort of rough. You start with the big areas, and you slowly work your way towards the detail. Don't start with the detail. These dragonflies have got these great sort of orange um, parts in, the, in part of their wings. You notice that that's just some light watercolor wash 
And to get the pale part out here, I just brush out most of the, the water in the brush. There's still a little bit of paint in the brush, but because it's attached to the water that's in the handle, it, you don't just get a dry brush, you actually get a soft little, the same color, just a little bit of a softer wash. So instead of just it looking scratchy, you get the same color even lighter. And then on top of that, you can put detail. This is detail done with a colored pencil. On top of that, a little bit of white paint blotched in there. It kind of gives you this effect of the, sort of the, the shimmer of a wing. And there's a little dragonfly. Right. So my approach is to start with that non-photo blue pencil, go to the graphite pencil. Build watercolor up in layers, starting lighter, going darker. And the detail is the very last piece that goes on. If you are going to do add white in, my favorite white is, um, what is it, permanent white. Permanent white gouache. So not watercolor, not transparent watercolor. The little Chinese white watercolor, you put that on, it'll make this sort of pale smudge. This, you want to get something that looks white. You can go blop, 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 and you get white spots. Let's take a look at another example, this time a botanical. And again, what you're going to see is the same approach, this time just applied to a different subject. So what I'm going to do is draw a lupin and show you how I build that up. So the problem with lupin is lots of little parts, right? <laughs> so kind of having a system to go about it helps me not get lost halfway up the lupin. So, I start with just how wide is it? Here's the central stalk of my non-photo blue pencil, and it's about this wide. The whole cluster of flowers. And then those are organized into several different layers. Some lupin species, the flowers come out in clear whorls. Others, they're a little bit more random. This species, they came out in clear whorls. And so I'm thinking of those here. I'm trying to think of this lupin plant geometrically like a cone that I've taken sections of. And doing this is going to help me see that plant in front of me three-dimensionally. So these are layers of flowers, and I'm visualizing those as little cut sections of a cone, again with a non-photo blue pencil. And then I'm going to start doing what I call drawing front to back, which means start with the petal that is the closest to you, and then I'm going to start to feed other ones behind that. The one that's right at closest to you, you get to see all of that. For ones that are kind of tucked behind it, they're going to be partially obscured by the other petals. So if I draw front to back, starting with this little one here, and then going chunk, 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 let's add in, so here's the next layer. All right, so I stop these where they hit that. All right, and then... All right. Um, as I start to put in more stuff behind it, do right, you see how having this drawn first and then drawing this further back, I know where to stop drawing this one. The other thing that really helps here is because you're intentionally going front to back, you remember that you are, as I go back in space, I'm going to use less detail and lighter lines. That's going to give that, make that one feel like it's back further. All right. And then I pop up to the next level. The one closest to me, bold. The ones on the side, a little bit more pale. See how that gives a little sense of depth? Heavier lines here, feels closer than those ones. All right, and then. And then the ones further back, look, less detail, lighter lines. And the same thing's going to happen, layer by layer. Intentionally going front to back gives you a fighting chance of getting a sense of depth in your picture. Because again, the trick is you don't draw the front the same way that you draw the back. If you do that, your drawing will flatten out. But if you have heavier lines, more detail in the front, and things overlapping, 
Um, and as you go backwards, the, the objects get overlapped, lighter lines, and less detail. You'll get this sort of feeling of space, even in just a straightforward line drawing. So that way you also don't get lost partway up the lupin. Then color. What I do is I start with lighter colors and I work my way towards darker colors. I'll often look up the plant and sort of see like, oh, the same color is here, 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 here. And so I will do that over the large area where I see that color instead of painting this one, finishing this one, painting this one, finishing this one. That will give sort of more of a sense of unity to the whole thing and it doesn't take as much time. Same color, now a little bit more pale in the back gives you more of a sense of depth. You see the same thing going on in Tony Foster's landscapes where things that are further back in space have less detail and they also are more pale. All right? So you actually don't see this much of a value change in the space of one lupin, but I'm using Tony's landscape drawing technique in the landscape of a single flower to give the illusion of depth. Then I bust out greens. And then I start to pop in some detail. The detail and those really bold things are the last thing that goes on. Well, second to last. Here's a little bit of highlight on the edges of some of these. But if you did this detail first, number one, you'd be tempted to put it everywhere. Notice no detail back here. Right. Um, it also, um, this way I can kind of come up, do the, the whole thing, kind of do all the parts that are closer in my head, then just go back in space, make it a little bit lighter, less detail, back in space. Again, using that front to back approach to, to get it. All right. There's the palette. And the last little demo here is probably the biggest contrast between Tony Foster and myself. Um, I'm going to do a landscape drawing for you, all right? My landscape drawings, um, here's my pencil for scale, all right? So I do landscapitos, all right? So most of my landscape drawings are about this big, all right? It turns out you can finish them in five minutes or less. <laughs> You just got to now do a lot of them, right? So what I do is I start with just a light line drawing. Notice that the, this ridge coming closer to you is a heavier line. Those same drawing tricks coming in in this situation, right? I figure out what my composition is going to be. The parts that are closer to me, I punch those lines a little bit. That really gives you a sense of depth. They also get more contrast and more detail. So if I have this forest with as much detail as, and, and darkness as this one, the drawing is going to flatten out. And then directly on top of this, I can start to paint my watercolor. So my values are already really well established by the graphite pencil. Here I'm just taking some of that light purple gray the back mountain and parts of the shadows on Half Dome. A little bit more color into those background here. Notice background really bluish, a little bit more green coming into here and then even more green coming into here. So as you go back in space, look for this in a lot of Tony's pictures too. The very often things in the background, there'll be kind of a little bit of a blue shift to them. That also gives you a sense of depth a quick sky, and you can be done with a watercolor of a landscape, if it's small, in about five minutes. So that's probably the biggest contrast between me and Tony Foster. <laughs> <laughs> this versus this. All right. um, but how many people, it's your first time here at the Foster? Okay, you, you really owe yourself coming back here and making a day of it. This stuff here in this museum is mind-blowing. He, to me, is an incredibly 
inspiring, inspiring artist. And you'll see solutions to things that you've had trouble drawing. How you look at like, okay, Tony, what, like what would Tony do? And you kind of can walk up to it and sort of see what, 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 uh, how, how Tony would approach that. This is my process for painting and drawing. So the reason that I make pictures now in the field, if I'm not directly working on a project like a field guide, is that if I don't bring my journal and use it to help me observe, I miss so much of what is going on out there. My scan, as, I'm, as a naturalist walking around in the world, I'm looking for these two things, wonder and beauty. So by wonder, I mean not like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? I'm looking for the subtle, the subtle little presentations of nature where nature, you kind of get this, like, this weird kind of like, ooh, that's weird feeling. That's funny. All right? Whenever you get that, that means that if you pay attention right in there, there's something that nature is about to teach you because you expect things to be slightly different than what you're seeing. And for beauty, what we want to work on is lowering the threshold for the things that make you go, Right? So if you need like a rainbow with whales jumping <laughs> by the sunset, right, you're missing a lot of beauty. Um, the National Park Service has discovered that just about anywhere they can stick up a sign that says scenic viewpoint. And people who weren't paying attention will get out and kind of like, oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> Um, a friend of mine taught me the trick, what he calls a beauty break. We'll be walking along and he'll say, all right, beauty break. And when you have a beauty break, that means stop wherever you are and you look around and you find just one little moment, that right there, that, see that right there? That's beautiful. You find beauty wherever you are. And it sort of trains you not to have to have like in your face beauty, but to start to see a lot of the micro beauties, the daily presentations that are around us every day. And so when I get these, I want to get it into my brain somehow, all right? But my brain is a really lazy chunk of electric meat. <laughs> it does not want to do work, all right? And so if I go like, brain, that's beautiful, check that out, my brain will go like, ah, oh. <laughs> ah. I'll kind of look at it in a stupor, and then, but really my brain's just, I'm staring, but my brain is checking out. There are three critical skills that I try to refine through the process of journaling, all right? And these are three things that, if you think about them in abstract, they're like, oh yeah, those are nice things to have, but how can you intentionally develop those? Here they are, attention, creativity, and curiosity, all right? All good things. I would argue that the best way to develop all three of these is to start to keep yourself a notebook or a journal of your observations. And I want to show you how and why this happens. So for attention, you say look at it, your brain quickly goes, look, it's not going to eat me, I can't eat it, I'm done. <laughs> All right? You want to get your brain engaged beyond that, you have to make it work. And if you're making a sketch of something, you have to look up again and again and again and again. And not just at the things that you know are there, you have to look for the things between the things that are there. So it gets you looking at everywhere, not just the places that you think are important. It's going to force you to notice things that you otherwise wouldn't see. For curiosity, a big part of my process is intentionally asking myself, hey, what's going on here? Why is that? How did this, when would the, you know, I'll intentionally look for questions in whatever I'm seeing. And the more I study nature, the more I practice as a biologist, the better and better I'm getting at, at realizing how much I don't know about everything. So I can now go out and look at a flower, a poppy that I've seen a thousand times, and in a short order of time, be able to come up with observations that I've never made about it and wonder questions about it that I've never thought of before. But it takes practice. 
especially if you're male. Because men in our culture, we train ourselves to kind of be confident and have answers, <laughs> right? And so not knowing things is actually a vulnerability. But, and so what, what a lot of people do is they'll walk along through the forest and they'll recognize everything that they already know and maybe tell you what it is. But what they're not doing is going and, what the, the, where the fun part is what is on the other side of the point at where you usually stop paying attention. And you have to do that intentionally. And I'll show you what intentional curiosity looks like. And the last piece of this is creativity. For creativity, the most useful definition I've heard for creativity is the ability to make functional connections between seemingly unrelated things. So functional connections between seemingly unrelated things. So what, is the, what do these three pieces look like in, in a journal, and how do you get that down? Well, um, my, this is my mantra to kind of get these. The easy way to remember this is when I'm walking out in the woods, I say to myself, I notice I wonder it reminds me of. I notice I wonder it reminds me of. I look at everything, and I'll say out loud whatever I notice. I'll say, I wonder. Sometimes I'll just say the words I wonder out loud and see what follows them. And to get myself to make connections between things, I'll say, what does this remind me of? Either scientifically or playfully, what have I seen before that in one way or another kind of connects me with this? And then I put that in my journal using these three languages, using drawing or art. But the purpose of this art is not to make pretty pictures. If you get a pretty picture, that's great. If not, that's great. The purpose of this is to get you to look again and again and again. I also use words. The part of your brain that thinks with words is different than the part of your brain that thinks with pictures. So if you're intentionally using both of those, you will notice more. And the third language is the language of numbers, to quantify things, to measure things, to time things, to count things, to estimate things. All right. If you start thinking with numbers, again, that gets you to think in ways that are different than what you normally do. And so what does this start to look like? All right. So here's a page of some observations. You'll notice that part of it is just what I notice. All right. There's actual size and data in here. All right. So the fact that I'm recording that this was drawn actual size, that's measuring. Right? Measuring is that easy. If it's life size, say that was life size. Right? And also questions. How fast did this thing emerge? Right. Um, here's another page from a journal. And you'll notice the observations, the questions, what was eating the upper leaves. Those are all munched. The bottom ones weren't. Um, Closed bell, does that restrict pollinators? Who is the primary pollinator of this yellow fairy lantern? And it reminds me of, what does this remind me of? That could be a 3D Escher flower. It could be the little shuttles in Star Wars. Right? Um, a bean prod with an extra seam. So go out and harvest your brain. Like, what, what do you connect with this thing? All right? Whatever you look at, will reveal new mysteries to you. And the trick is to get yourself to look at something until you are noticing details that you've never seen before, even in something that you've seen a million times. This was the salamander in my garage. And then the really exciting thing was, so I was getting in here, I was sort of zooming in on its head. There's the detail of the texture of its skin, its body. You notice kind of zooming in and out. We're writing, we're asking questions, and then, James Halfpenny was really excited about this. I had to contact him. It pooped. Yeah. And there's the detailed drawing. I put it under a microscope. These were the carapaces of ants. It had ant, undigested ant heads throughout it. And then these were little parts, exoskeletons of larger insects. It was really, really cool. There was, oh, actual size of the poop. All right. So um, that is. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of using writing, drawing, and quantification put on a page. So all I'm doing is this system and putting it on paper. This is your brain on paper, <laughs> right? And now you're thinking, well, that's nice. It would be cool to do that. 
but I'm not an artist. And in order to do this, you got to be an artist. Well, here's the thing. This is not a gift. This is a skill. This is a skill that anybody who chooses to can develop to a very high degree of technical competency in one year. In one year. So if you say, I cannot draw a straight line, I can only do the stick figures, you start drawing on a regular basis, in one year, this will come to you. Um, every month, I teach six free nature journaling workshops at different locations around the San Francisco Bay Area. We may be adding a seventh here in this town. Right now, the closest one to here is in Saratoga at West Valley College. So every month, a different topic. This month, we're doing drawing birds. All right. And you start coming to these. I will teach you how to draw. And if you do it on a regular basis, in one year, you will be drawing. You'll look at something, and it will come out the way that you are thinking. All right? You can do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I, uh, she's even got the. <laughs> right? So, this is, it's just a skill. But developing this skill will dramatically change the way that you encounter nature. When Tony Foster goes out into a landscape and he spends weeks on the side of a canyon painting and thinking and seeing it in all sorts of different light, he falls in love with that place. He becomes a steward for that place, an ambassador for that place. A lot of what he does goes to support conservation and conservation education, all right? So when you spend that kind of attention, it fundamentally changes who you are and how you relate to the land. And the same thing will happen to you. If you start using the approach of keeping a journal, a door will open in your heart. You will see nature in a way that you have never seen it before. You will remember it more vividly, and you'll have that extra little motivation, which we need right now, to work together as a community of stewards to protect and preserve the biodiversity of this planet. Thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.